Shabbat Shalom, which means happy Sabbath or thereabouts in Hebrew, and Sabah al khir which of course means good morning. <laughs> Arabic, we started our trip in Egypt, and uh, so we heard a lot of Arabic and learned just a few phrases. Um, and so every morning we would be, get greeted with Sabah al khir um, moving our way into Israel, of course, the language changes into Hebrew, so it was a lot more Shabbat Shalom. However, um, each language has its interesting, you know, uniqueness. In, in, in that world, uh, there's a guttural sound that we are not as familiar with. As a matter of fact, it's something that is more offensive in the West when you're clearing your throat, kind of. And I mean no disrespect or trying to be derogatory, but that <laughs> sound we don't have a lot of words where you make that pronunciation and we're not as smooth at it. So it was kind of embarrassing trying to talk to the locals, even if you knew kind of what to say. You never could sw say it, at least I didn't feel like I could with the smoothness, but um, uh, it's kind of like a CH and SH and a K put together. Um, even like a, a, an example word I thought is like we say Bethlehem, right? Very smooth, very Bethlehem, right? That is not how you say it in Aramaic or in Hebrew. It's Beshlehem. Right, and it, I'm emphasizing and embellishing it just a little. But again, to our to my Western English, it's kind of you're kind of spitting at me when you say it. But that's they would um, say it like that. So that's part of the the journey. Well, when we got back, um, oh, you have it. I did remember. Okay, good. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, had a wonderful time. But right before we even get into the trip, we want to uh, share with you something that exciting that happened right when we got back from the trip, and that is this little girl. We had made the arrangements, and we'd been planning on getting a puppy, so we have a brand new, about eight-week-old Boston Terror. Ten weeks. Um, uh, called Mildred, who we call Millie. Uh, terrier, not Terror. That's right. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> So she's a lot of fun, and we kept it as a surprise for our kids. They knew nothing of this until they walked through the door, and it was kind of like, here you are, and they, uh, of course, were very unhappy about that, and um, they'll, they'll have to get used to it, I suppose. But we have a new addition to our family, um, Millie. So we've got Millie and Gertie right now, and so we just wanted to share that little part of our journey with you. The main Bible verse that we continually were kind of uh, introduced to or went through that Dr. Carl Kosart, who, who uh, led our, our journey, um, came from Genesis 12. And if you'll recall, I was preaching about Abraham before I left and going through different of the earlier stories of Abraham and how God was using his family to illustrate the plan of salvation. So it was very appropriate and memorable and this is uh, the verse as it says in Genesis 12. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And that's kind of what we did. We went forth from our country and we left what was familiar to us to go to this uh, very same land. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. This, was, this land was intended and this culture and community was intended to be a blessing, and I will bless those who curse you, and the one who curses you I will bless, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. It is called the promised land and the land of blessing. You flip that. What? And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. They knew what I meant, though. So I'm we have a very it. advanced congregation. So they get it when I misspeak. They know that. But anyway, so we were continually reminded of this promise and of the reason why God brought um, the children and his community into this land. We went to three countries, and I just throw the map up here real quick. We started out in Cairo and stayed there for several days doing the, uh, the museums and the pyramids and, and the monuments around there. Then we made our way into the Sinai Peninsula to the traditional site of Mount Sinai and climbed the mountain there, made our way into Jordan and up to uh, a city called Petra, um, we spent a day there. We'll talk about that. Um, then we went just outside the Dead Sea um, and to the Jordan River, crossed over into Israel, went up to Galilee first after a quick visit at Jericho, 
and then made our way back down to Jerusalem um, and, and ended our trip in Jerusalem. And again, uh, we can't share everything. We went to Mount Carmel, we went to Mount Nebo, Qumran, Masada, um, just so many places and spent time there. Um, but uh, we're going to try to keep this so it's not too um, uh, uh, boring, I guess, is what word comes to mind. These are very significant places, obviously, in the Bible. Egypt, many of our, our great Bible stories come from Egypt, but I don't think the average Christian, at least not in my experience, appreciates how important Egypt is to the Bible story. We remember the Exodus, we remember the pharaohs, and of course, you know, Jesus went there for a short time in his life. But I don't, did you know that Egypt is mentioned more in the Bible than Babylon, Assyria, or Rome combined? Egypt is discussed, uh, included in the story, referenced in prophecy, in poetry, in narrative, more than any other pagan land. It's more than the Philistines, the Moabites, or the Edomites. Combined, God really wanted His people to have a great connection and influence with Egypt. He clearly desired the conversion of Egypt, and there were some moments of great uh, 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 communication and cooperation uh, between these two lands. So Egypt is incredibly important, and we could talk a lot about that. Jordan, many great stories, the ministry of John the Baptist, the ancient kingdoms of Moab and Edom, the Nabataeans. The ministry of Paul and where Paul, uh, partly where Paul went after his conversion, and then of course Israel, uh, everything else. So that is where we went. So we started out in in Egypt. What do you remember about Egypt? Well, our first stop was at this Museum of Egyptian Antiquities, where we saw um, a lot of statues of the different pharaohs. Uh, we saw some sarcophagus. Do you know what a sarcophagus is? Okay, it's where the pharaoh was. The coffin. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and then um, this little stone tablet is the first time that the Hebrew, Hebrew? Israel. Israel was mentioned um, in ancient Egyptian. It's right about there. You can see it clearly, can't you? Yeah. I know. It's just as clear as can be. But it's so cool to see the hieroglyphs. I mean, I remember in school learning about Egyptians. Um, nobody walked like this. I'm just saying. I expected it. <laughs> nobody did. Um, they actually walked normal. <laughs> so, um, but it was it was really cool to see um, so many very 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 old pieces of um, art. Yeah, we're talking about almost the beginning of of recorded history uh, with the Egyptian culture. And so, if you love history and you love culture, I could have spent my whole time at this museum. It was, it was tremendous, and so many biblical connections with, um, with the stories. And our, our guide did a great job of always including um, a devotional or a biblical connection, and obviously seeing the very first external reference that we are aware of to the kingdom of Israel, um, very important. Um, I, I think I did share, um, and I'll go ahead and share this now, um, I, uh, when I got back from this trip, my wife did all the picture taking for us, which was wonderful. That's not my thing. So she was the picture taker. I took one picture while I was there on my phone, one picture. And then when I got back from the trip, my phone had a problem and I had to do a complete wipe and I lost it. My one picture that I took, but it's similar to this. Um, uh, in, when we got to Israel, there is one external reference to King David in all the world, only one. And it's called the house of David stone. Um, it's written in Aramaic where uh, it says House of David. And I took a good picture of that with my phone. I got found right where it was written. I said, this is what, because my name's David. You, you knew that, right? My name's David. So I wanted to see the House of David stone. I found it, took a picture, and once you know, I've lost it. Of course, you can look it up and it's, it's very um, uh, easy to find. But these are very important historical things to, to build uh, into the Bible story, these, uh, these artifacts and things like that. We also went to, um, this is a newer museum in Cairo, a museum, National Museum of Egyptian Civilization. Ooh, there's a sarcophagus. We took, I took a lot of pictures of those, but I only put one in the slideshow. But my favorite part of this um, museum was that toe. That is a prosthetic toe for a lady in Egypt. She was a pharaoh's daughter who lost her toe, I don't remember exactly how, but they built that prosthetic to slip onto her foot. Um, and this is thousands of years ago. I just thought it was so incredible because I'm a nurse and I like, you know, stuff like this. 
but um, the medical advancements that the Egyptians had was just mind blowing. So I just thought that was super cool. Dave did not. Think I, I, that was I cool. love toes. It was a great toe. Um, <laughs> it was a very spiritual experience for me. Um, this museum, unfortunately, we weren't allowed to take pictures, but this is the museum where all the mummies were. 23 um, royal mummies. And you had to go down into a dark uh, area yeah. in catacombs where you could physically see um, all the mummies, which is uh, kind of gross. I mean, they're not exactly happy-looking people, they're, um, uh, but they're preserved very well. But the, the, the biblical connection is, you know, you got to see uh, certain individuals that were probably the pharaohs connected to Moses. And their names are even Moses. It's Tutmos or Tutmosis. And for depending on what historical uh, 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 element of history you ascribe to, because there's different uh, theories about the period of the Exodus, if you're the earlier day Exodus uh, believer as I am, Tutmosis II would have been the pharaoh who Moses would have been uh, connected with, and we got to see his body there. He was, he was right there. Uh, and then um, the lady that came before him, Hatshepsut, who we called what? Hot chicken soup. Hot chicken soup. <laughs> hot chicken soup. We got to see hot chicken soup. Uh, and uh, so, again, to see it, the, the remains of people from, um, you know, three, uh, 4,000 years ago, um, and, you know, it, it was... Very interesting. And I'm pretty sure there was one called Ramses. And I know that the Prince of Egypt is not totally accurate, but it was still kind of cool. Yeah, that's the see. other a theory that it was during the time of Seti and Ramses. So we got to see them as well. Um, and the, the museum and the artifacts and the history. Uh, we got to see King Tut. You, you heard of King Tut before? Of course, he was the one that had that beautiful head uh, dress, you know, that's all gold and, and everything. One of the few that remained intact and wasn't um, destroyed by robbers or, or stolen. So again, weren't, weren't allowed to, although there were people taking pictures, <clears throat> uh, we were good, good, uh, tourists and did not take, uh, pictures, um, because we were asked not to. So, oh, by the way, that's Pastor Eli, Elia uh, behind there. Um, yeah, which by the way, you learn a lot about people when you spend two weeks on a bus with them. <laughs> and, uh, that was a, a part of the fun and part of the journey too. Wait, I got to go back. I loved the mummies. I thought it was so incredible to see how they prepared them and how year, thousands of years later, I could walk into a museum and be like, oh my goodness, that's, that is, was a person. I thought it was, and they had their teeth, some of them, and their hair. It was so crazy. So we, it we're was actually, incredible. We're actually considering mummification ourselves for when the time comes, <laughs> and it seems like a good route to go. <laughs> That's cryo. Yeah. Um, food. I only have this one slide of food just because this picture was hilarious. See me holding that and, nice little knife. Um, <laughs> Carolina from the conference office really has a powerful swing because she was the first one to cut this delicious dessert of Nutella and strawberry and banana and I don't know what else, but it was so good. And these little pitas were at a Jordanian restaurant in Cairo. Jordanian? Yeah, in Cairo. Um, and just all the different sauces. We ate a lot of falafels. We ate a lot of baba ganoush. Do you know what that is? Eggplant, yum. And a lot of hummus. Not hummus, hummus. hummus. <laughs> and pitas. But we had so much good food. Um, but that was probably my favorite thing I ate was that dessert. Wasn't it good? It was, it was so adjustment. delicious. We had, oh, it was great. And and the sword was kind of fun. So. Yeah. We had a good time at that, that restaurant with those people. They were people. super nice. So the big thing, obviously, about Egypt is the pyramids. And we got to see, I think, in the neighborhood of a dozen of the most famous and, and uh, large pyramids. These this are the most famous. These are the three pyramids at Giza. The, the one on the left there is technically the largest one in the world. That's the Pyramid of Cheops or Khufu, 481 feet tall. And when you stand in front of it and you look at it, it is like looking at a mountain. And you realize that human beings basically built a mountain, and it's very overwhelming, and it kind of catches you more than I anticipated. I thought, oh, look, rocks stacked on top of one another, yay. But it actually, it hits you um, even more dramatic, at least it did for me to actually see them. And then uh, a quick picture of us in front of the Sphinx, and it's hard to see, but right 
that dark spot right there in, the, in between the paws of the Sphinx is something called the dream stela, which describes the death of one of the pharaohs who was likely the pharaoh of the time of Moses. Again, and it talks about how he died unexpectedly, his son died unexpectedly, and it kind of fits with the biblical story of the plagues that fell on Egypt and how the firstborn, including the firstborn of the pharaoh, died. And so it's called the dream stela, and it's... Uh, um, you know, biblically connected and significant. And one thing I learned on this trip is um, the pyramids, I thought were built by a bunch of slaves. I thought that the Egyptians made people do this, but our tour guide from Egypt, Mikhail, said it was an honor for people to help build the Pharaoh's um, tomb. That's pretty much what a pyramid is. Um, and so I thought that was really interesting. And these were amazing um, that's inside. Those aren't the ones at Giza because I don't remember if I took very many pictures, but you can see Dave bent over. Um, some of the spaces were very short and you had to even crawl. Um, so I didn't want to bore you with a whole bunch of pictures. Um, but the hieroglyphs, the, I mean, look, they have Crayola color crayons. They didn't have Crayola color crayons to write, to color these in. They were just, it was really neat. By the way, I wanted to mention, this was, this was not a vacation. This was not about rest and relaxation. It was up and at them every day. So just keep in mind these pictures. Uh, we're often not looking our best. And uh, just remember that we, me, not anyone else, me. And just remember the camera adds 10 pounds to men. It's men only, not to anyone else. He did tell me he was going to say that. But, yeah, so. Um, I think I look pretty good in these ones. It's toward the end that you'll she notice. She looks great. I was tired. Um, some mornings we had to be up at 4.30 in the morning. Yeah. Some mornings we got to sleep until 8, which was amazing. Um, so here's some more inside the pyramids. And I'll explain, sorry about, you know, the backside. I was behind Dave. But I, those are some of the steps that we had to climb. That's going, I think um, that's going backwards. Oh, you're right. So the you're way right. the pyramids work is the entrance to the pyramid is usually about halfway up. So they would have built a rampart, but a rampart to get up to that. But as soon as you get to the opening, you had to go down, and then you had to go up again inside to the middle of the pyramid. So it was kind of this up, down, up journey. And depending on how it went in, if it was really steep going down, you didn't want to go down frontwards. So you'd actually go backwards in these very narrow. Um, openings. And there's only one entrance. So if people are coming out while you're going in, you'd have to hug the side and people would go through. And it, it was a very experience. What? That was why I put that picture in. So you could see we had to fight traffic yeah. sometimes. Um, I did not adequately prepare myself for the hard work of climbing in the pyramids. I did all of them, but it hurt. And the bats. There were <laughs> bats in some of them. And that was fun, too. <laughs> yeah. Surprised us. We weren't prepared for that either. Yeah. But really, really cool. Um, that is us by where a sarcophagus was inside one of the pyramids. Um, some of our group um, picture inside the dark pyramid. Not all of them had lighting. I mean, we had some. They didn't have electricity. I don't know if you know that. But they, they would put in some lights for us, uh, which was nice. And Dave is holding a mud brick. It's easily 500 pounds. I'm showing you how, how able I am to, <laughs> to build these massive structures. These were the mud bricks. Now, the poorer, when Egypt was poorer, they would build the pyramids out of mud bricks um, because that was cheaper. The bigger and more impressive pyramids were built out of granite, which they had to get from 900, I think, kilometers, not 900 miles, 900 kilometers um, south mm -hmm. on the Nile. So depending on the situation. But where we are here is um, actually the pyramid that would have been built when Joseph was in Egypt. Um, the pharaoh's name was Sennacherib. Sennacherib. I brought my little book here if I needed a cheat sheet. But um, we actually walked in, and, and this is where we took our first video that we tried to send to the church to say hello from, and apparently it did not work. We apologize for that, but we were standing in front of the, uh, the uh, pyramid that would have been the pyramid of Joseph's day, and we said hello, and unfortunately that didn't work. But that's where we are on this. So we actually got to go inside the pyramid and stand in the place where almost for certain, again, if you accept the earlier dates of uh, the Exodus and the period of Joseph, Joseph would have been there. He would have been standing right there. He would have been part 
of that, uh, that region and that experience of the building of that pyramid. So that was, that was pretty cool. And you can see in that picture how big some of the bricks were in, in, this one. in the far. Yeah, I think they said the average stone was two tons, the average stone. Um, some of the bigger stones, obviously much bigger and then a, a variety of size. But um, we had a great group. We, we had to do the camel ride at least once just to say we did it. Um, they were friendly, a little smelly, but uh, a lot of camels. You wanted to talk about that one. <laughs> yes, I do. This picture looks weird because I didn't realize the pyramids are like right in the city of Cairo. I thought like we were going to be driving into the desert somewhere to see these pyramids. The people that live in Cairo, that's their view in Giza. The pyramids are right there, right off the highway, which you see all the traffic. Can I tell you, they drive crazy oh, yeah. in Cairo. I about had a heart attack I don't know how many times because... They don't keep lanes. They use horns to say, I'm on your left side, um, squeezing through between two buses, motorcycles. It was intense. They, yeah, it was crazy. Ten rows of cars. Whew. I wanted to show my, uh, <laughs> my Egyptian headdress. I don't have all the talents of how to dress it up and everything like that, but uh, took advantage of, of getting... The, uh, the scarf and the headdress, the head so covering. supporting the Egyptian economy is important. And we did One dollar at there. a time. Yeah. Everything was like a dollar, even to use the bathroom, dollars. Okay, now this picture is very important. I want you to look carefully at those smiles. You see those <laughs> smiles? All <laughs> lies. Those smiles are <laughs> lies. It was a three-mile hike all up, uh, upwards to the top of Mount Sinai, and it was grueling. It was tiring. Every time Gina said, turn around and smile, I was lying. I was not smiling on that walk. But we did our best, and we got to the top, and uh, it was a very wonderful experience at Mount Sinai. It took about six hours to drive from Cairo to Sinai. Um, and, uh, and then a six-hour hike. And then it was a six-hour. We actually had to come down in the dark. We, we walked up in the afternoon but had our flashlights and were prepared. We actually had one of the Bedouin guides join us who spoke no English except for Slowly, slowly. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. It's the only thing he really knew how to say was slowly, slowly Yeah. Um, as we were going down, but he was very nice. Um, and Some of our group took camels up. Rosemary. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I did not. I kind of wish I did after the fact, but I made it. I only wanted to quit like 17 times, but every time we were just getting closer and closer to the top, so we made it. It was beautiful. It was right at sunset. Um, now I think I can hike Camelback. I think I'm finally fit to hike Camelback because this one was pretty brutal, but it was so, it was good after the fact. Now, I just want to share from a biblical and historical perspective, this is the traditional Sinai that we went to. Um, you know, Moses says that Sinai was in Midian. Paul says that Sinai was in Arabia. Um, St. Helen, uh, St. Helena is the one who uh, first described this in the fourth century as Sinai. So for 1700 years or so, Christians have gone to this mountain, but it's probably not the true Mount Sinai. True Mount Sinai is probably in Saudi Arabia. However, this is still a very important place that traditionally people have gone on pilgrimage to, and uh, we felt very privileged to be able to go there as well. We're going to move on here. So this is toward the ending of our time in Egypt, clearly, but I wanted to introduce you to um, our helpers that were there, Mama Marco, um, which we nicknamed him because he was like our little mother hen. He met us at the airport at midnight. He helped us get through all the, um, getting our luggage, through customs, visas, all that stuff, um, reminding us not to give anybody an inch because they will get in front of you. Stay together, stay close. He got all of our tickets for us, um, super nice. Uh, Marco, Yusef was our bus driver who seriously was the hero. <laughs> I don't know how he drove that big bus in the craziness that I described earlier, but he did. And he was very, very kind. And Mikael was our guide. He is a Coptic Christian. They're all Coptic. Um, oh, they're all Coptic. Oh, I remember him for sure. Anyway, um, he gave us just so much information about history. Uh, about the Bible, along with Carl, our, um, 
our uh, our guide from guide Walla from Walla. Walla Walla. Anyway, very nice gentleman um, who made our time in Egypt just so good. We also did have security, but I didn't take any pictures because we weren't supposed to take any pictures of any of our security. Um, they are very careful with tourists in Egypt, and they want um, especially them to be safe. So you had like a security guard with you on all your adventures. I don't think we ever really felt like we were in danger. Did you, we never really felt like we were. It's just part of their system and um, it was really well done. We, I enjoyed this group of, of, mm -hmm. of Egyptian guides so much. Learned a lot about Egypt and the Coptic yeah. Christian Church and uh, the history there as well. Yeah, they were all wonderful. Moving on to Jordan. This was um, the Hyatt in Petra. Um, my favorite. Different kind of Hyatt. Than my Hyatt, favorite though. place because it's built like into the stone. Um, I won't say the negatives because there were some, but the food was great. And you mean it was the, uh, such millipedes that were that long? <laughs> that were in certain people's rooms whose names will not be mentioned, but are sitting here enjoying this with us today. Um, anyway, yeah, they and it overlooked the valley, which was beautiful. We got to hear the imam give, well, recorded an imam. No, the, it's an imam. So Muslim countries, they do five prayers a day, and they broadcast it. Yeah, but it wasn't live. It was a recording, right? It was live. Okay. Clearly, we. it was someone giving the call to prayer. I didn't put it on here because I didn't know how videos were going to transfer. But but it would echo down, echo through, down the through the Echo down through the valley. It was so cool. So yeah. that was our, but, but, by the way, this is our favorite hotel, both in how it was built and the food there was the best, in my opinion, too. Yes. Petra was one of my favorite stops. Um, if you've seen Indiana Jones, you've seen the treasury before. Um, I took a picture of Dave, and then I decided to be brave and climb up on a little rock. Um, it was a big rock. <laughs> but um, so neat to see that they built these buildings into the side of the mountain. They carved the it right out of the Nabataeans. limestone. Mm -hmm. um, so beautiful. The picture on the far right mm -hmm. is um, the monastery. Neither were... This was a treasury monastery. They were neither one of those things, but that was, that's what that's they're called. That's just what they're called. They didn't function so, as those. They're just yeah. giving those names. Next. So we spent a whole day in Petra. Um, it was, uh, it, again, an ancient culture that uh, is connected to, obviously, the people in the Bible days would have known of the Nabataeans. Um, Paul uh, would have probably been in the city of the Nabataeans and here in Petra. There were two high places that we went to. One was the high place where they would make sacrifices. The other was the monastery. I think we got the most exercise that day. We had in the neighborhood of 30,000 steps, and we had 168 flights of stairs, according to my, my Fitbit that we climbed. Um, and it rained earlier in the day, and that's why we have our jackets and hats, and it was a little chilly, but it got to be a great day. And again, just to see that they had carved an entire city into the side of the mountain, and had they had another thousand years, that entire place would have been one big carved city, I'm sure, but... Mm -hmm. Um, anything more about Petra? Nope. Are we missing anything, Scoble? <laughs> there were so many places Put to hike there. Put you on the there. spot. Um, after leaving Petra, we went and saw... No, oh, this is out of order, actually. This is when we left. This is out of order. So this is before getting to Jordan. We, oh, we crossed right. the Red Sea um, and uh, took a little ferry across the Aqaba Gulf on our way to Jordan and went through Jordanian security. And she stuck her head in the picture for some reason. She's always poking her nose and trying to get into our business. No, that's Carolina from the office. If any of you have ever been to the Arizona conference office, uh, she was part of the trip and we enjoyed um, spending time with them. So seeing the Red Sea and crossing that, so that, that was out of order. Sorry about Sorry that. Sorry about that. Um, after we left Petra, we went to the tip of Jordan and... Is that wrong too? No, this is just the Dead Sea at the edge of the okay. Jordan and Israel border. We actually got in the water. We actually rubbed the Dead Sea mud all over, well, almost, and got <sighs> into the water. I didn't want to show you those, but my skin felt so soft. It was amazing. How many of you have been to uh, the Dead Sea before? Any of you? Some of you have. Uh, I describe getting in the water like being like a bobber. I couldn't keep my legs underneath me because you're so buoyant, it just keeps wanting to flip you up. It's really a fun experience. It's very salty, so you can't get it in your eye, and you're splashing around. And um, um, Unfortunately, it was the end of the day. We only had a limited time to be there. 
Um, but very unique experience, very uh, wonderful to be able to be there and, and all the mineral properties of the mud and loved it. It was really fun. I don't usually float, but that was fun to actually float <laughs> in, in the Dead Sea. <laughs> Um, right before we got into Israel, we went to the Jordan River. Um, it's muddy and gross. I don't know if you know that. There are parts of it that are not muddy and gross, but we went to the muddy and gross part so that you could understand how no, big of a deal it was for um, Naaman to dunk himself seven times in that water. And Carl did a good job of trying to keep things as close to the biblical narrative as possible. There's many theoretical sites where Jesus may have been baptized. There's other places that are very beautiful, very clean, very touristy, where they'll do um, events and baptisms. But if you follow the biblical narrative, this is more closely related to where Jesus would have himself gone to John and been baptized. And I just want to point out, that's the river that's not like a part of the river or like a little side stream. That's it. It is nothing more than a little mud trickle. Now, it's changed a little bit over a couple thousand years. The Israelites have put some dams in and, and things like that. But it's not too different than what it would have been like um, in those muddy waters when Jesus was baptized. And, G and Gina was right about the mud. There, we, did, we did a baptismal service, and there were some who chose to be a, a, a traditional baptism into Jesus. But if you remember, John wasn't baptizing people into Jesus. He was baptizing them into a baptism of commitment and or repentance. And so some of us that wanted to experience that, we chose to have that baptism experience as well. We didn't put the pictures up there because we're all in bathing suits and whatnot. But we decided to join and go in those waters and have a baptism of commitment, a baptism of John, you might say. It wasn't that our baptism into Jesus was being redone. Um, but yeah, you step in and the mud's about three feet. And if I'd taken one more step, I'd probably have mud in places still that won't come out because it was so muddy. Um, but we went through that experience. We went into those muddy waters and had that moment uh, very spiritual of baptism and singing. By the way, about half of our group was Spanish. It was about half. Spanish. So we got to hear singing in Spanish. Most everything was translated, and it was just an enjoyable thing to have both uh, experiences in both English and the Spanish language as well. Yes. So the Jordan River, very, very um, wonderful experience. Um, we saw wild camels. I thought they were so cute. I did not realize they actually had wild camels. I thought everybody, you know, owned the camels or they had ranches or something. Anyway, um, and some of our snacks, Dave found Doritos. You know, after a week or so of foods you don't recognize, <laughs> there just comes a point where you want something you know. And so when we went to a, a little rest stop and there was some Doritos, I was like, Doritos is what Cheetos. I want. And so it was, it was good to get something a little bit more familiar. And so. this is, oh, go back. I didn't talk about my picture. Does anybody know what I'm eating in this picture except for Scobo and Rosemary? A Jordanian oh. almond. In Jordan, it was delicious. They're so good. I love them here, but I had to take a picture of me eating one in Jordan. Anyway, we went to Jericho. That is Sam, the sweet camel. I Likes been, to give kisses. Aside from my pet, I've been kissed by a dolphin, and now I added camel to the list. He was a little smelly, but he was really sweet, and his um, little owner was right there. Several of the ladies um, had their picture taken with Sam. Um, in Jericho. Yeah, so our first stop after a three-hour uh, ordeal getting across the border, which, you know, and the things are never simple in Israel, but we're thankful we were able to get in Israel. Our first stop was in Jericho um, and got to go to the ruins and the tell. And we also stopped by a sycamore tree that is probably over a thousand years old. Doesn't go, unfortunately, to the time of Christ. It's not that old, but it's a very old sycamore tree. And of course, Zacchaeus, the story of Zacchaeus takes place in Jericho. So it was neat to go see an old sycamore tree in Jericho and, uh, and go there. So after we crossed into Israel, we did start to have a new experience. Um, we had avoided sickness. Now, uh, typically in a group this big, someone's going to get nausea or someone's going to get traveling, you know, diarrhea or something, but we had avoided all that. But as soon as we crossed over into Israel, several of us started to get sick, me included, with like cold-like symptoms. And it turned out that we had been exposed and and had got, and picked up a cold um, from, uh, well, you can probably guess where we got the cold from. No. no. 
Actually, it was from Canada. We got, we got colds from Canada. The Canadians gave us colds. No. It's true. No. The, yes, it is true. The tour group, the tour group just before us that worked with our Jordanian guide had gotten colds and our Jordanian guide got a cold. Why are you shaking your head? Because technically it wasn't Canadians. It started was, with it Canada. It was the tour guide. Nope. I blame Canada. We never met Canadians. I blame Canada. Don't blame Canada. So I love my, Canada. So my cold was fairly mild. Others got um, about, by the end of the trip, at least half of our group got some uh, symptom. Uh, I had it bad for about a day, but not terrible. Rosemary got it. Betty got it. Um, and even uh, Carl uh, started coming down. But we endured, and it wasn't the end of the world. So this picture is, um, is this Arbol? Yeah. Yeah. This is on the top of Mount Arbol overlooking the Sea of Galilee. Um, I appreciated Carl that he would always give us time to have some reflection, some prayer time, to sit in these places where, um, you know, where Jesus walked and the disciples walked. So um, I think Dave took this picture of me. You can see several of us at different spots um, being able to have prayer and just some reflection. Um, such a beautiful view. So many people have asked, what were your favorite experiences? And it's hard to narrow it down. But I've been telling people the Sea of Galilee was probably one of my favorite experiences of the whole trip. Um, we got to take a boat ride out onto the sea. I'll just leave it for here for a second. Um, Jesus did the vast majority of his ministry in the region of the Sea of Galilee. So we saw the Sermon on the Mount location and where other miracles and Magdala and things like that were. But we took a boat ride out on the sea. It was beautiful. It was peaceful. It was calm. They shut down the engines while we were out there, and um, we just got to float on the water. There'll be a picture um, a little bit later on it. But during that time when we were on the sea, Carl shared the story of the death of his teenage daughter. And it was very moving, very emotional. And he just made the connection of, you know, sometimes the storm comes and the storm is real. It's not that the storm is a, a fake storm or a made up storm, the storm is real. But if you have Jesus in the boat, it will be well it will be made well. So despite the storm that came into their life, and for me, that was just a, a very moving, a very touching moment to be on the Sea of Galilee in that area and to, to be invited to consider such an emotional and, and serious reality and to have that promise that if you have Jesus in the boat, it's going to be okay. Even if that storm is real, keep trusting in Jesus. So that's what I've been sharing for the most part um, as a very meaningful time for me. And um, Topka was one of the places that we stopped. I thought this was significant because this is where they traditionally say um, Jesus fed the multitude. So there is a church, a Catholic church there, um, the Church of the Multitude. <laughs> and um, right there on the Sea of Galilee, we had a devotional time. We, he read the story. Um, and uh, it just... To me, it was all part of the Bible coming to life, being at these places where um, miracles happened. And um, then I took pictures of the cows. <laughs> so I took pictures of all the animals and all the things. Also very close to the location where Jesus would have reinstated Peter after his resurrection. When it says that uh, they saw Jesus on the seashore and he was making breakfast. And he speaks to Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? And he asked him three times. That's also associated with this approximate location. We got to see a reenactment of a Nazareth village. This is in the city of Nazareth, but they have built a model city there and they have actors and they kind of take you through a tour of what the life would have been like with real uh, making of, of textiles and tools and pottery. And uh, they did a great job there. We had a very, very dry guide who was very funny though. Um, and we enjoyed his... Uh, his explanations of going through Nazareth. Oh, and so, did you want to? Um, no, this was us sailing. So this the is on Galilee. the sea. I, yeah. Um, we danced. We did some some Hebrew dancing. Yeah, if it's Hebrew, fun. it's holy. You can do Hebrew dances, and it's okay. You know, where the Other girls dances, are in a group and the guys are in a group, and those. you go in circles and kick your legs and clap, and it was really fun. Um, and then the other picture is a boat that was found in the Sea of Galilee um, that's from the first century. So probably something very much like what Jesus and his disciples would have 
um, sailed on. Yeah. It was really. You can just see the exact what it would have been like to have been on a boat um, in the time of Jesus and the disciples. We're kind of going to move a little more quickly here. We, 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 we skipped some things as we make our way down to Jerusalem, but uh, we got to do this exciting excursion. What was this? This was Hezekiah's Tunnel, hence the title. But it was walking about a third or half a mile, half a mile. Um, in, the, in the walls, in water, most of it to our ankles, some of it a little bit higher. Um, and the pictures are not very good because it was dark in there. But um, it was really a fun experience, except for the beginning where my feet were on like a cattle grate to get into the water. That wasn't very fun. But... Um, is this the one they built in like Yeah, they did, they dug this tunnel in 100 days. This was when uh, Sennacherib and the Rabshakeh was attacking uh, Judah and Hezekiah is defying them. And so he builds this tunnel to keep the water away from the attacking army. And it's a miracle of engineering and how they are able to do it. And it's a very uh, popular thing to do if you're in Israel is was, to go through Hezekiah's tunnel. Was this where, at one point we were in, this, I'm sorry, my memory is failing, where they were coming from two sides. Yeah, they dug it from two sides, and then so, they tried making sure they found out where to hit each other, and they made some mistakes, but they figured it out, and so it's kind of a serpentine tunnel. Yeah. So we went through Hezekiah's tunnel, and it's mentioned in the Bible too. The Wailing Wall, or the Western Wall, um, we went there on Sabbath or on Friday night, and um, when I originally went, I had my scarf with me, and uh, you can walk by the wall through, through one of the accesses without actually going there, and it's not a problem. But if you actually want to go to the wall, you go through special security. And I had my scarf with me, which I got in Egypt. Didn't realize it when I walked through, but security stopped us and said, you can't wear that. And the reason why you can't wear it is it, is, uh, it has the Palestinian colors and pattern, and they don't allow that uh, at the Wailing Wall. So we had to tuck our, our Egyptian and... Arabic um, stuff away, but you still had to have your head covered. I had a hat on, but I went ahead and grabbed a yarmulke anyways, um, because that's part of the tradition, and that's the required if you're going to be at the Wailing Wall. This was not Friday night. We were not allowed to take video or pictures on Friday evening um, before Sabbath, uh, just because it breaks the Jewish um, laws of lighting a fire by using your cell phone. So we did not, this was taken, um, I think, earlier in the day or the day before when we were there. Um, so it was, for me, a really, I mean, I've seen pictures before of this, but seeing um, the Orthodox Jews there praying and people sticking their little prayers into the wall and having, I didn't think I'd get a chance to even be close enough. Honestly, the pictures I've seen, it's packed, but yeah. I did have a chance on Friday night um, on the lady side, which is the right side, the left side is the, for the males, to uh, to go up and have my own prayer um, at the wall, and it, it's just it was just an interesting experience. Uh, it was. Did you go, Scoble? Were you there? Uh, for me, it was the most awkward moment of the whole time, going to the Wailing Wall on Friday night. You feel out of place. I felt completely out of place. Uh, they are very friendly for the most part. Um, we don't have time to get into it. Maybe on another uh, time I'll share kind of my uh, feelings of how Orthodox Judaism has evolved over time. Um, but it is called the Wailing Wall. It's a sad experience. It was sad. I felt sad being at the wall, and there, I have a lot of reasons for that. Um, but I know it's after 5 o'clock uh, already this evening, so we're going to keep moving along here. Our, our clock on the back is, is wrong. The, the entire city is filled with markets. It's very touristy, very common as you go through. We went through several of the shops. We got a few trinkets. We're not huge into to that, but we got a few things. Did you want to say anything? No, that's where I got this cashmere scarf. We did go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is the, uh, the, the major site that most archaeologists would argue is the location of the burial and crucifixion of Christ. Of course, there's a massive church that's built over it. You have to kind of use your imagination to picture a mountain where Calvary would have been and a tomb where um, they would have laid Jesus. That is the slab. It's a very small room that you have to bend over to get into. Only about three or four people can fit in it and you have to kneel down. But that is the slab that they say Jesus was laid on. That is the slab 
Um, if and again, we don't know for sure, but for for thousand, almost two thousand years, uh, again since Saint Helen. That has been uh, the tradition. We had a little prayer there. Pastor Paul joined us from the um, uh, Paradise Valley Church. He actually led the prayer. He'd never been there before, even though he'd been to Israel. So that was uh, very moving. And this stone here is supposedly a piece of the original Calvary uh, rock um, that they've covered over with glass. Um, some of you may have been to Israel before. Did you go to the garden tomb? Okay, and, and Gordon's Calvary. There's a big debate about which one is accurate. I don't know. I wasn't there. We went to this one, and we, we tried to honor the experience and the memory. And see, Pastor Jean is already saying he disagrees. So <laughs> anyways, did you want to say anything more about? Um, I will say something. So is it a huge line to get in this? And, and it goes from like eight people wide until it narrows down to one person to get into this. And uh, G- Gina got accosted by another tour guide that tried to push her out of the way and threatened to call the police and have her not quite arrested, but escorted. And because of the crowds, I'd kind of, I wasn't there at the time. I'm probably better that I wasn't. But uh, uh, she stood her ground and said, hey, I'm not moving. I've been in this line. Uh, you, don't touch me. Don't push me around. And by chance, we happened to see that tour guide like five more times on the trip. His group was great. They were all from Atlanta. They were great. They're like, this is no problem. You, we're happy to work with you or whatever. But he was a very driven individual. Yeah. <laughs> so I was very proud of my wife for being strong and standing her ground. The Mount of Olives and uh, looking into the Temple Mount. I'm going to go kind of fast. Is that okay? The Dome of the Rock. And I, I don't know if you guys remember or, or have been watching the news, but like three days after we left, Israel stormed the mosque on the top of the Temple Mount, and now there is more turmoil, more rockets fired, and all that. We just missed that by a few days, and so we're very thankful that we weren't there during this most recent problem. I don't know how that problem rates with others. There's always something going on um, there, but uh, God spared us from that. The Garden of Gethsemane and uh, the Mount of Olives... Um, We did get to go on the Via Dolorosa that we sung about. We heard the wonderful song by Valeria last week um, during the Passion Play um, to walk the steps and stages that Jesus would have walked. We happened to be there on Palm Sunday, so we went ahead and joined the crowd that walks the Via Dolorosa. Um, We did it up until about the gates of the city and got to be with the group. This is uh, our tour guide from Walla Walla. That's Carl Kosar. He's the head of the religion department there. And I got to go to Turkey with Carl a few years ago, and, and he does a great, great job. I'm sorry I'm going quick. Is that? Okay. Yeah, you stop me if I want anything else. Okay, this is the last picture. This was our uh, Israeli tour guide, uh, Aron, and his son, Sue. That's how his name is pronounced. So those of you familiar with Johnny Cash, a boy named Sue, here's, here's a boy named Sue, okay? Um, that's kind of how it's pronounced, even though the R is there. We loved them to death. They were wonderful. Um, uh, Iran is a passionate archaeologist and a wonderful guy. And he says he only brings his 12-year-old son when there's a group he knows he can trust them with. And so uh, after he met us, he, he brought his son, and we all just fell in love with him. He was, so, he was like the little sheepdog, kind of keeping us together. He would kind of pull us all together and point us where to go. And uh, so it was a wonderful, wonderful experience with Iran and Sue. Anything else? Um... No, I just, all the information that the guides were able to give us just added to the depth of the trip. And when the guides in in Israel and in Egypt were by far much more enthusiastic about the information, so I feel like I got a lot more out of those um, guides, but Sur was my favorite, too. (laughs) He was so cute, very friendly, speaks several languages. Mm -hmm. Um, he speaks something from India. Sorry, Betty. Tamil. Tamil. He so they lived Tamil. in India for 15 years. He speaks years. Hebrew. He speaks English. And I don't remember what other, what other languages, but such a fun, smart kid. And at the end of the trip, we asked him, where, if you could go any of the, anywhere in the world, we asked Sue, if you could go anywhere in the world, where would you want to go? And he said, Arizona. Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, and, and Aron has been to the States. He's done some tours with archaeology. And you never know, maybe someday Aron and Sue will be standing right here 
and be able to share even more from, from their perspective. So wonderful, wonderful. Well, it was very, very hard to narrow this down. I hope it's not been too, uh, uh, you know, boring or anything for you. But uh, we're going to share in the end here just our quick takeaways to close out our our turn here. We didn't talk about Masada. We didn't talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls. We didn't talk about Nebo or Carmel. Peter's house. Uh, yeah, the, so much more, so but uh, we just wanted to hit these highlights. Gina, what are your takeaways? Um, this tour brought the Bible to life for me. I, didn't, I never wanted to go here. Full disclosure, I was afraid to go here. Um, but I'm so glad I went, and it was really cool to see the pyramids, to see the Temple Mount, to see all these places. I enjoyed seeing and spending time in other cultures, um, seeing the the ladies. There were very some in full-on burkas, some that only had their head covered, some in the, the long dress. Um, really, really cool. Seeing the, the Jewish ladies and the Jewish men um, in larger... We have some that, that are here in Scottsdale, but in large numbers was interesting. Being there to witness the observance of Ramadan, Passover, and Palm Sunday was, to me, a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Um, we were walking into the Temple Mount when hundreds of thousands of Muslims were leaving from a prayer service that they had for the beginning for the first Friday of Ramadan. And then walking in the footsteps of Jesus just before Easter made this Easter even more special, um, I think, for me. And uh, those are my, my four. Okay, and mine aren't that different. I let her go first, so uh, she kind of took most of mine. But uh, obviously, I love the Bible, and I love culture and history, so it was definitely a, a spiritual adventure to go to these very places uh, where God did wonderful things. Um, you know, it depends on how you look at it. I'm not always such a people person, but I do love people. Uh, you know, I guess as a pastor, that's kind of required, Ralph. I, <laughs> supposed to. I love the experience of getting to know more of my conference because we were together on that bus for all that time. So being able to experience this with the people from the Arizona conference and then just to experience the people there as well. Um, I thought that was a, a wonderful thing. Um, for me, these were our lands of complexity and contradiction. Um, I mean, just, again, we don't have time to go into it, but just think about what Jerusalem means, city of peace. It's not a city of peace. It's a contradiction. It's called the Holy Lands. Well, God did some wonderful holy things there, but it is not a place where holiness is, is elevated and celebrated. So it's the promised land, and yet uh, promises are broken on a regular basis. It's a city and a land of contradictions. That's just one of my my takeaways, um, and yet it's still the world of Jesus. And it just reminds me that if Jesus could come to that part of the world, things weren't, aren't that different today than they were 2,000 years ago. The characters may have changed. You know, instead of the Romans, it's Muslims, and instead of, you know, different, there were the Nabataeans and the Phoenicians and the Syrians and things like that. But the world is just as complex as it was when Jesus was there. And if he can come and pronounce salvation and draw people together in that place, he can do it again, and he can do it in our world here in Arizona and Phoenix as well. This is still the world of Jesus. So um, those are some of my, my quick takeaways, and there will be more stories and things shared throughout um, opportunities as we have time to, to share it. But um, That's uh, the, basis of, the basics of our trip. We, we hope that that has been a, a part of the journey that you could share with us, and um, if you have other questions, we'd be happy to talk more about what our experiences were. But we've already gone over a little later than normal. Would you stand with us as we have a prayer to close? <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you so much. And we thank you that we can have opportunities to learn more and experience your grace and your story um, when we go to places like this. Father, I just pray that we would use every opportunity to draw closer to you uh, thank you, God, that you allowed Gina and I to go on this trip with many others um, and that it has changed us and made us uh, more aware and more in touch with the stories of the Bible and the great things that you have done for us on our behalf, Lord. I pray that that first promise uh, and that first challenge that you gave to Abraham uh, would be ours as well, that we would follow and go where you call us and that we would allow 
our lives to be a blessing to those around us and that through our lives, Jesus could be seen so that all may come closer to salvation in Jesus Christ. Lord, that is our prayer. Please bless our congregation and our church. Bless the remainder of this Sabbath. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone, so much for being here. We will see you again next week. God bless you, and Shabbat Shalom.